now with this bill that we will achieve an equal opposition to society. It is not this bill which will achieve this. It is not today that we are going for an equal opportunity to society. Ever since the existence of the Labour Party, we have relentlessly, relentlessly, brick by brick, building against all odds an equal opportunity to society, giving dignity to those who had no one to speak for them, the voiceless of this country. The first time the idea of an Equal Opportunity Act was mentioned ever in Mauritius was by me, not in 1968, as Honorable Lobigadu was saying, but in 1990, when I became leader of the Labour Party. I was not even a member of Parliament then. <clears throat> And during the electoral campaign of the general election of 1991, both myself and Honorable Xavier Luc Duval canvassed the point over and over again in public meetings. But they came to power in 1991. The idea had, been, had come to the surface. Did they take it up? No. Was it because the Labour Party and the PMSD were saying it was a bad idea? The reproach that you make us? Look at the facts. No. And during the fir my first term as Prime Minister, when the MMM was out of government, I then asked the then Attorney General, Honorable Razak Piru, to start working, prepare the legislation to give effect to equal opportunity. He worked with the state law office on this bill. And believe it or not, Mr. Speaker, sir, you might yourself remember when the bill, the draft bill, was nearly ready, some people started going around urging people to oppose that equal opportunity bill that we wanted to make. Maybe some of you have forgotten, some of you must, must remember. Mistakenly, I suppose, not to put another word on it, mistakenly, they were saying that the Equal Opportunities Act that we were proposing would mean introduction of quotas. And it would mean positive discrimination at the expense of meritocracy. That was the campaign that was being made. I decided then we must put the la pendule à l'heure, Monsieur le Président. I decided then to counteract on this misinformed campaign that and articles were written in the press that started to take root. I asked the chairperson of the Commission for Racial Equality in the United Kingdom on an advice from uh, a friend of uh, Honorable Juval, Mr. Kadeo Senali, he brought it to my attention. Why don't you ask the chairperson for racial equality in the UK to come to Mauritius? I think his name was Mr. Gurudev Singh. To come to Mauritius, trying to explain he's the chairperson of the Commission for Racial Equality in the UK. And he's of Indian origin tried to come and explain to those who were objecting to this bill what exactly equal opportunity meant. He did take up my invitation. He did come here. And he did have meetings. It was on television. It was also in the press with parliamentarians equally. And he told me afterwards he was really surprised that people could be against an equal opportunity bill. He was totally surprised. We also started explaining in different uh, meetings we were having that giving equal opportunity to all our citizens is the right thing to do. There's nothing to fear from equal opportunity. 
After this, this campaign, we were finalizing the bill when I called the 2000 election. They came to power again in 2000. Now there had been a debate. People knew what equal opportunity meant. They came to power in 2000. If, Mr. Speaker, sir, the draft bill was nearly ready. There was some functioning to do, but it was nearly ready. All they had to do, if they really believed in equal opportunity, when you hear them today, you would think they are now more keen on equal opportunity than us. But if they, if they really believed in equal opportunity, all they had to do, finalize the bill, it was nearly, uh, nearly done, fine tune it if you wanted to do, to do it, and bring it to the House for a debate. We would have applauded. <laughs> no, that's not what they did, Mr. Speaker. Sir. That's not what they did. They allowed it to stay in the drawer for nearly five years. You talk of wasted time. Another five years gone. 91 to 95, four years. Another five years gone. Never brought it. What did they do? Only on the very eve of the general elections of 2005, on the very eve, they then made some minor alterations, but they did not bring it to the House for debate. No. They, they gazetted it, as if to let people have now their opinion. They gazetted it and then dissolved Parliament, so it never came for a debate. They will say there was no time. There was time to bring the budget forward to April. But there was no time for such an important thing. There was no time. These people are going to give us lessons now. A bill doesn't become an act of parliament when you gazette it for people to give their opinion. Everybody knows the bill has to come to the house before you can make it. Make it a moment. These people are going to give us lessons now. Always the same tactic. Always the same tactic, Mr. Speaker, sir. They never even thought of the bill. The idea didn't come to them. Never acted upon it. But on the eve of the election, they then tried to show, ah, is they, bringing, they were bringing a bill. They've gazetted it, stealing ideas from the Labour Party. Political gimmick. That's what it was, Mr. Speaker. A political gimmick. In 2005, we put it in our manifesto, in our program. We brought it to the House. Not in 2010. In 2008, we brought it to the House for a debate. And it was adopted in 2008. And I remind them, the opposition walked out when it was adopted. You forget, you walked out. However, I did explain earlier, I don't want to go and repeat what I said, Mr. Speaker. Sir. I did explain that we did not proclaim it because we saw real difficulties. If we did not want to, to do it, we would not have brought it in 2008. It's so simple. We would have brought it like you did on the eve of the elections of 2010. But there were real difficulties when we looked at the details of the implementation of the legal, of the administrative, of the institutional changes we were making to the structure itself of the National Human Rights Commission. The Protection of Human Rights Act itself was being re-looked at. We have to re-look at it. The UNDP made some further suggestions. And I said it appeared that given the complexities of the implementation and what we were reviewing, how we were going to do it, we might end up diluting the effect of what we wanted to achieve. And I did acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, sir. I did acknowledge and I gave credit what is due. The leader of the opposition then did say during the debate, that he thought we should not mix the Equal Opportunities Division with the National Human Rights Commission. We took that suggestion on board, Mr. Speaker, sir. And we have, as we have been reviewing the National Human Rights Commission, we took that on board and I acknowledge it. I'm not afraid to acknowledge something that I find eventually when we were looking at the complexity of the law, that definitely it was going to dilute it uh, too much, that it's better to have it and I acknowledge it. This new amendment bill, Mr. Speaker, sir, brings new sections in the bill, 
including that separate equal opportunity commission which will stand on its own. And Mr. Speaker, so let me just remind members on the other side. I've heard a few say that, Mr. Speaker, sir, that this bill will not change anything. Is it not now with this bill that we will achieve an equal opportunity to society? It is not this bill which will achieve this. It is not today that we are going for an equal opportunity to society. Ever since the existence of the Labour Party, we have relentlessly, relentlessly, brick by brick, building against all odds an equal opportunity society, giving dignity to those who had no one to speak for them, the voiceless of this country. It started then. The right, you know, we were, they were talking about trade unionists. The right for workers to organize as trade unionists was given by the Labour Party itself. Universal right to vote. All this goes towards an equal opportunity to all adults, and then later on to the young, age 18. At a time when government had been in power for some time, we knew the difficulty. The leader of the then, Labour, the, the then leader of the Labour Party knew of the difficulty. It was made clear to him that people on the age of 18 tend to be a bit rebellious. They will vote against. He said, never mind, that is the right. If they can fight for the country at the age of 18, they should be able to vote at the age of 18. We get free health care. Again, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to go through a long list. But all those things, Mr. Speaker. But one thing I must say. Giving free education in 1977. What greater achievement that was the goal of equal opportunity to the young of this country. And the very people who are sitting on the opposite side voted against it. They were against it. Was a, it was a bribe. But it was, in fact, a reality. That was the greatest leap forward that was giving real equal opportunity. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I won't go into the details what we did afterwards, free transport for students. Again, in the same empowerment uh, program, right? granting land to ex CHA workers. All this goes towards equal opportunity, Mr. Speaker, sir. Provision of crash for mothers. You know how much that is going to help empower mothers to be able to, to do what they want to do to get their emancipation, Mr. Speaker, sir. I don't want to go through the whole list, but it's the whole gamut of things. Granting land to ex CHA workers, empowerment program, fight against poverty, social integration, all this. That was giving people, those who had less chance in life, give them at least an opportunity to get to the level playing field. That is what we're doing. And that is a follow-up with this bill today. And it is, I must say, Mr. Speaker, so it is beyond belief. I couldn't believe I was hearing this from Honorable Obigadou when he said, and I quote because I wrote it quickly, I think he said, Avant cette loi de 2008, il n'y avait aucune loi pour proscrire contre la discrimination. I find it incroyable, surtout venant d'un homme de loi, because he forgets about our constitution, Mr. Speaker, sir. our constitution of 1968, which has not one section. But a whole chapter, chapter two, Mr. Speaker, sir, which enshrines this protection of fundamental rights. A constitution which talks about against discrimination, that you cannot discriminate. That is the supreme law of the land. That was done in 1968. And I must tell you, eminent lawyers came to Mauritius to look at, uh, we were looking at uh, media law and privacy law and all those things. And they were surprised, and I'm talking about QCs, eminent lawyers. They told me they were surprised that in our constitution, because there are other Commonwealth countries which had constitution as well, former colonies of the, of the British government. But our constitution, they say, has gone further in the protection of human rights. Many of the provisions of the human rights, European human rights legislation, are actually in our, not all, but many of them are actually in our constitution. That was their surprise. The leader of the opposition and other opposition members have been saying this bill will not stop discrimination. Opposite to what happened in 2005, they say, when they say there was no meritocracy. 
I heard Honorable Shakil Mohammed tell them, give some examples. But let me tell the MMM, they forget what they did in 1982 when they came to power. They forget. They amended the Constitution in order to institutionalize the sacking of career civil servants. Many names I can give you. And you know what is surprising? Ewe Juvala, give one example, was the brother of Sir Gaetan Juvala, who had campaigned against us in the 1968 election. After we won in 1968, Ewe Juvala, the brother of Sir Gaetan Juvala, was promoted. Not sacked, promoted. Because we believe in institutions and we believe in people. And you now, you, you will suppose as donner de leçon. Let me come to the, some of the points raised. The other point raised by the leader of the opposition was against discriminations against trade unionists. He has deplored the fact that the, we have amended it, but we have failed to provide for non discriminations on the ground of membership of a trade union. Mr. Speaker, sir, there is no need to amend the Equal Opportunities Act for that purpose. Section 31B of the Employment Relations Act of 2008, which we brought, already provides that no person shall discriminate against, victimize, or otherwise prejudice a person seeking employment because of his past, present, or anticipated membership of a trade union or his participation in the formation of a trade union or a worker for his involvement in trade union activities. It provides effective remedies for discrimination on the ground available under the Employment Relations Act. All your rights to challenge discrimination under the Constitution is preserved. I've explained it earlier on. It is preserved. We are providing for a cheaper, simpler, fast-track remedy with a fairly substantial potential remedy is being provided in this law. And Section 41, above that, Section 41 provides for an appeal. It gives you grounds, still open to an appeal to the Supreme Court on a number of legal grounds that are in the, in the bill itself. So you're not forfeiting your, re, your, your case to go and appeal to the Supreme Court, that is not there. It's simply not there. All we are doing is to provide a remedy which is faster, which is cheaper, and will take less time. That is what we do, simpler. That is all we're doing, Mr. Mr. Speaker, sir. And then there is, I noted a few remarks. I think I should make the point about, Honorable Boda was the last person to make that point. The leader of the opposition made the point about the power being given to the Prime Minister. The President will act on the advice of the Prime Minister who will consult the leader of the opposition. It's a mistake. Lawyers should go and look back at the law. It's a huge mistake if you think, even the law as it is, that the President doesn't have to consult the Prime Minister. Even the laws that they have passed, simple laws, you cannot say the President will consult the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, even if he consults. But this hasn't happened. I have a relationship with the President that we haven't had to come to that. But even if he consults, he's bound, let me tell you, go and look at the law, he's bound to take advice, the advice of the Prime Minister, at the end of the day. Whether the issues will have to be re-looked at when we talk of reform, electoral reform, we will look at it, I'm sure. Certainly, certainly, not just Caucasian, the Shiatulu MMM, they are keen on it. We have also said we are keen. You were never keen on it. So we, we're not going to, to worry about you. But we will discuss it. We will discuss it. But under section, it, you must have a plain reading of section 64 before you say so. I'm sorry, but I have to say it. Under section 64, one, the President has to exercise all his powers under an ordinary law on the advice of Cabinet or a Minister or, if it need be, the Prime Minister, if the Prime Minister, any Minister concerned, 
acting therefore under the authority of cabinet unless the constitution says otherwise and the power to appoint is vested in the president under this act mr speaker not under any of the act he will have to act on the advice of cabinet or the minister and there is a court case there is a court case on this i think a dial case if i'm not mistaken saying this mr speaker sir. these were the main points that were made during the debate i've responded to the main points although it was just repetition of the same points but mr speaker sir i say again net low one doubt and i say some people say I think Honorable Buddha said he wants a guarantee from me. He wants a guarantee from me that this will be proclaimed. I can tell him we will not do what they have done. We will proclaim it. We will have to choose people, of course. It's not easy as he knows it himself. It's not easy to get the right people, but we will find. We will find the right people. And we will proclaim it. You know, when we brought in the National Human Rights uh, Commission, it was us who brought the law, by the way. And we looked for people. We looked for people, nobody was interested. Nobody, nobody was interested, and I said so in Parliament. Again, we will, let me assure the House that we will, that's the whole idea of bringing this. We have taken time, and I agree, and I acknowledge it, but I give him a guarantee that I'm sure we will have to find somebody who will accept to do the job. There is a bit which says that uh, on terms and conditions are the President thinks fit. If we think we have to to broaden it, enlarge it, I will talk to the President, but will certainly our intention is to bring another step forward towards an equal opportunity society. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Le Premier ministre, le Dr Navin Ramgoulam, a précisé que le 16 décembre 2008, l'Equal Opportunities Act a été adopté à l'Assemblée nationale mais que cette loi n'a pas été proclamée vu la complexité du sujet. Let me Mr Speaker sir give some details why this amendment is being brought today. The underlying philosophy when the law was passed was that there would be four different divisions under the supervision of the National Human Rights Commission. Government at the time did not want to create a multiplicity of institutions. It was then felt that the creation of divisions within the Commission would provide greater cost effectiveness and efficiency. The Equal Opportunities Division was given multiple responsibilities, namely to build a better society, free of prejudice, with fair chances for all, guaranteeing every single person gets treated with decency, dignity and respect, to protect people from unjust and unequal treatment, to ensure that every person has an equal opportunity to attain his or her objectives in various spheres of activities, to achieve social, cultural and economic stability, to ensure that no person is placed or finds himself or herself at a disadvantage by reason of his or her status, namely his or her age, colour, creed, ethnic origin, impairment, marital status, political opinion, race, sex or sexual orientation. However, while we were looking at the details of the implementation of the new legal, institutional and administrative structure of the National Human Rights Commission, we found that we might not attain the objectives we set. The protection of the Human Rights Bill itself was being re-looked at, as well as the National Human Rights Commission in the context of this restructuring exercise. Le Dr Navin Angoulam a ensuite énuméré les amendements proposés, incluant le fonctionnement de l'Equal Opportunities Commission. Il a aussi souligné que ce projet de loi est la preuve concrète que la démocratie est bien vivante à Maurice. Mr. Speaker, sir, the battle for political and social emancipation has always been the core, at the core of our political raison d'être. Our policy thoughts and actions will always be guided by our unflinching commitment to social justice. Let there be no doubt about the importance that this government attaches to the promotion and safeguard of human rights. Let there be no doubt also about our commitment in combating discriminations in all its forms, promoting equality of opportunity and enhancing social justice. The independent and dedicated Equal Opportunities Commission that we are setting up to ensure the effective implementation of the Equal Opportunities Act clearly demonstrates the political will and determination to take bold and ambitious actions to transform Mauritius into an exemplary opportunity society. 
And as we have shown, we believe in democratic debate, and we do take on board any suggestions made by the opposition which can improve our laws. Mr. Speaker, sir, putting people first was not simply an empty vote catching slogan, as some would have it. It will always be a fundamental philosophy underpinning all the actions of my government. With these words, I commend the bill to the House.